Good evening. It is so great to be with you this, uh, this fourth Wednesday of Lent. Um, we've had an incredible series thus far, and we've got uh, uh, just another opportunity tonight with the Reverend Dr. Michael Lloyd. And then next week we have um, Bishop David Reed, um, who will be here with us. And he is going to take, um, the hope is that he will take all of the, the previous talks and say, so what? Like, you know, why, does, why does Jesus matter? And why does evil matter? Why does Sabbath matter? Why does it matter that we care for each other? And, uh, and what, why does compassion matter? And what does Jesus have to say about that? So we figured the bishop of anyone could probably do something with that topic. So, um, um, so we're, we're glad that you are here this evening. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for this night, for this opportunity to be together, and we're so thankful for the gift of having Michael Lloyd here, uh, for the words that you have given him and the words that he will share with us, and uh, for this opportunity. Lord God, open our hearts and minds to hear what he has to say. Uh, may we ponder that in our hearts and May it become part of, of who we are and how we live out our faith. We are so thankful. And so bless us this night. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And uh, we, we are so thankful to the Parker Lecture Series Endowment. And Meg and, and Harry are here tonight. And so thank you all for, um, for providing this. And we're so deeply thankful. that uh, it's just a wonderful gift and what a great opportunity. Um, Michael was sharing with me that he was supposed to come here three years ago, um, but there was this thing called a pandemic that uh, kept us from doing that. So we're just glad that we can now do it. And so um, with that, please stand and we are gonna sing a hymn, number 688, verses one, three, and four. One, three, and four. 688, one, three, and four.
You may be seated. Well, I met Michael last night at a reception for him, and um, uh, it was just uh, from the very beginning a lot of charm and humor and grace and humility um, just comes from this this man of God. Um, and he has some pretty good jokes. Ah. <laughs> Patrick thinks his are better, but we might hear a few of those tonight. So um, evil with humor, it'll work. So, um, but uh, we are just so blessed to to have you here, Michael, and we are thankful for you and for your ministry and for all that you do, and we're thankful that you're here this night. Please welcome Michael Lloyd to Christ Church. Well, thank, thank you very much for your um, over-generous uh, introduction. <coughs> it reminds me slightly of, uh, there was a very kind of famous and influential clergyman in British church. I think we're going to do it right. You run a seminary? <laughs> <laughs> I don't do the AV. There we go. There we go. Is that better? Yes. Well, that's what you say now. <laughs> uh, I was talking about John Stott, who was a, a famous English clergyman who once uh, was introduced. Uh, he was about to speak, and uh, the person said, in the introduction, I would crawl a thousand miles on my hands and knees to hear this man speak. And John Stott said he then proceeded to sleep through the entire address. Uh, uh, he said, I can only conclude that the crawl had worn him out. Uh, but anyway, thank you uh, for, for your introduction. It's very, very good to be here with you. So there was a surgeon, an anaesthetist, an architect, and a politician who were debating amongst themselves which was the oldest and most venerable profession. And the surgeon said, well, clearly surgery is the oldest and most venerable profession. Uh, if you look at the book of Genesis, God takes a rib out of the man, makes it into the woman, first surgical operation. <coughs> Ours is the oldest and most venerable profession. At which point the uh, anaesthetist says, oh, but what does he do before that? He puts the man into a deep sleep. First case of anaesthesia. <laughs> Clearly ours is the oldest and most venerable profession. At which point the architect said, oh, come on, that's Genesis 2. What does God do in Genesis 1? He creates order out of chaos. He brings the universe into being. First case of architecture. Ours is clearly the oldest and most venerable profession. At which point the politician said, ah, yes, but who created the chaos? <laughs> I, I, I'm surprised to hear you laugh. I thought that uh, our country was the only one that had that view of its political <laughs> leaders. There we go. Uh, so what I want to look at with you is that question, who created the chaos? If the world has been created by a good and loving and all-powerful God, why is there that tragic element to it, that clash between systems which crushes people and hurts people? Why is it that the world is full of the amount of suffering uh, that it is? And what I want to do is to look at four answers that are given to that question within Christian theology, uh, which I think are useful I think they get us some way towards an answer, but I think they're all ultimately unsatisfactory for various reasons. Uh, and then I want to suggest what I think is a less inadequate, uh, less unsatisfactory answer. Uh, share that with you and see what you think. Because uh, I think we're gonna have time for question and answer afterwards, so uh, that's the chance to get your own back. So, um, do you have handouts, by the way? Does everybody have at least sight of one? That's good. 
And the first useful but unsatisfactory argument is uh, the free will defense, the free will argument. <coughs> Suppose instead of being in love with my very lovely wife, uh, I was in love with somebody called Gertrude. And I choose that because it's not a common name and there's usually nobody here called Gertrude. Is it, am I safe this evening? That's, <laughs> that's encouraging. Um, <clears throat> and suppose, just suppose that Gertrude didn't return my love. I know it's stretching credibility, but <laughs> there's no accounting for lack of taste. So I love Gertrude, but she doesn't love me. So far, so bad. Suppose further that I pour out my woes to a psychiatrist, and at the end of the session, the hypnotist says to me, look, I happen to be able to hypnotize people. Uh, it's one of the tricks of the trade. I use it to cure people of wanting to smoke, that sort of thing. Why don't I, says this psychiatrist, why don't I meet up with Gertrude, hypnotize her, pretending it's just for fun, and while she's under hypnosis, tell her that when she wakes up, she'll be madly in love with you and that she'll consider you the most attractive, witty and intelligent man she's ever met. <coughs> and supposing I agree to this on the grounds that it's purely therapeutic for Gertrude, <laughs> healing of her, her current blindness and helping her to say, see things the way they really are. Uh, I think the ethics committee might have had something to say to this particular psychiatrist, but there we go. And supposing it worked, would I be satisfied with the love that I received? Would I feel affirmed and wanted and chosen and cherished, knowing all along that it was a sham? It was a pre-programmed reaction in her and not a freely chosen self-giving. I can't imagine anybody being satisfied with that. Or if they were, I don't think they'd know the meaning of the word love. Love has to be freely given, or it's nothing at all. And I would rather forfeit Gertrude's love than force it. Because love that is forced is not love at all. So it is, I suggest, with God. God could no doubt have created a world in which there was no suffering by programming, by brainwashing, by hypnotizing, by controlling all his creatures so that they always did exactly what he wanted them to do. By presetting them to love him and to love one another. He could have refrained from giving us any real freedom from letting us make any real choices or decisions. He could have, could have kept all power tightly in his own hands, and that way he could have ensured that only what he wanted to happen would ever occur. I take it that God could have made such a world. But if you were God, would you want to make such a world? Because if there's no real freedom, there's no real love either. Your creatures wouldn't love you. It would be a pre-programmed sham. And actually, you couldn't love them either. Or if you did, it would be simply you loving yourself. Because if you kept all power tightly in your own hands, you'd be the only one who did anything in your world. You'd be the only one who acted. The whole thing would be a pretense. It would be a toy world. Because if you don't have freedom, you can't love. If you don't have choice, you don't have character. It's, it's choices that build character. And if you don't have power, you're not a person, you're a robot. And I'm not sure I'd want to make a world like that any more than I'd want the love of a hypnotized Gertrude. Give your creatures freedom and choice and power, however, and they become different from you. They become real people, making real choices, forging real characters of their own, characters that are capable of real relationship and genuine love. 
Now, a world like that would be meaningful and worthwhile because in a world like that, love would mean something because it would be freely given. The only problem, of course, is that in a world like that, love can be withheld as well as given. In a world like that where people are different from God, there is necessarily the risk that they may act differently from how God would like them to act. They may use their freedom in ways that hurt God, hurt others, and hurt themselves. That is always the risk when you let power out of your own hands and give it to others. Ask any parent. Freedom is essential because without it, existence is meaningless. But freedom can be abused. And that, the free will defence believes, is precisely what has happened. That's why the world is the way it is. Because it's a real world and not a sham world. It's a free world and not a robotic world. And tragically, we've often used our own freedom to choose what's wrong, to choose what looks good for us at the expense of what is good for others. So why did God create a world full of suffering? Answer, he didn't. He created a world that was good, but free. And it is our abuse of that freedom that has brought about the suffering. Now, the argument I've been mounting so far is what is known technically as the free will defence. So-called because it seeks to defend God against the charge of being to blame for the evil and suffering in our world by attributing that evil and suffering to the free will that he has given to men and women and by suggesting that it was nevertheless a good thing that we would, were given free will. And it's an argument that in its more philosophical articulations has been shown to be logically watertight. Except for one obvious gaping hole. And that is, it may account for why our world has hatred in it, why it has murder in it, why it has wars in it. But what about diseases? What about earthquakes? What about drought? What about famine? They're not the products of human malevolence. They seem to be built into the way the world is. How can we explain why such appalling tragedies are allowed to disfigure God's creation? So the free will defence is useful because it explains very well, I think, why God might allow us to do nasty things to each other, what's known in the business as moral evil. But it's ultimately unsatisfactory because it fails to explain what we call natural evil, that which doesn't have any obvious human cause or agency. So let's look at useful but ultimately unsatisfactory answer number two, and let, us, let me assure you that they get shorter uh, as we go along. <laughs> the second argument is the suffering is good for you argument. Uh, the argument here is that God allows natural evil and suffering because they're good for us. There are those who argue that suffering from natural causes is character building or soul making. That God is justified in making the world a place of suffering and a veil of tears because it will be better for having gone through such suffering than it would have been without. I don't know if you know the... Um, <coughs> Christian soup, the chicken, Christian soup, chicken soup for the soul books. Do you know, do you know those? Or at least aware of them. Uh, subtitled stories to warm the heart and inspire the spirit. You may not be aware of a parody of chicken soup for the soul books called chicken poop for the soul. <laughs> subtitled stories to harden the heart and dampen the spirit. And I suspect you already know me well enough to know which I'm going to prefer. <laughs> um, so this is a little bit uh, from Chicken Poop for the Soul. And you have to imagine a kind of Hollywood voiceover, which I'd better not attempt this side of the pond. 
I guess the first important lesson my father taught me was to be independent. I was just four years old when he took me to the shopping centre and left me there. I'll never forget that feeling as I watched him drive away with just that little loving wave. A few days later when that nice policeman brought me home, my dad and I both knew I'd learnt a very important lesson. I'll never forget the day of my ninth birthday. Dad was driving and I was next to him in the passenger seat. Suddenly he screamed, think fast, and jumped right out of the car. I had to learn to drive right there on the spot. But as long as I live, I'll never forget that broad, proud smile on his face when I pulled that old car up the driveway. That was my old man. But as Dad got older and that cough became worse, he knew he wasn't going to be always there for me to make sure I could handle the real tough times. I was 14 years old, I remember, when the police came to the high school to arrest me. <laughs> As they booked me, they explained that an anonymous caller had informed, me that, informed them that I'd held up a convenience store. I smiled. That was my old man. <laughs> but two days later, he was right there to bail me out. My old man isn't here anymore, but I never forgot the lessons he taught me. So sometimes late at night, when I'm sitting there on the floor, I look at my son, sleeping like an angel, and I know that someday soon, I'll be taking him to the mall. <laughs> Just like my old man. You see the point that it's parodying, uh, which is that you, you, the, his father did created really unpleasant experiences for him to go through so that he could mature and develop and become independent. And it was good for him. And it's not without its truth. God can and does bring good out of suffering. Uh, I know that from my own experience. The year before I was ordained, I went through a terrible year of, of doubt and depression and had to rethink my whole faith from scratch. Uh, and yet I look back at that as probably my main qualification for ministry. At the time it felt like a complete disqualification. But this view is ultimately unsatisfactory for two reasons. First of all, the miracles of Jesus. When Jesus healed people, he didn't seem too concerned about the benefits of which he was thereby depriving them. He didn't say, no, I won't heal you, the suffering's obviously doing you good, the illness is a real blessing, so I'll just leave you like that, you have a good day now. <laughs> or if he did, it was never reported. No, he just went ahead and healed them. Because for him, Suffering and death were distortions of God's good creation. They were things that shouldn't be, that shouldn't occur, that shouldn't happen. And they were things to be fought against and eradicated. Not to be rejoiced in, not to be celebrated, not indeed to be tolerated. And it seems to me that we who follow him should have the same view and fight the same fight. And the second reason why this view is unsatisfactory is because some suffering is just so appalling that it seems almost obscene to talk about the good that may come from it, as if that somehow outweighs the evil of the suffering itself, somehow makes it okay. Well, it isn't okay. I think that can be glib talk that belittles people's its experience of their own suffering. So yes, God does bring good out of suffering, and I know that from my own experience, and I expect others do too, but I don't think that lets him off the hook. So let's look at the third useful but ultimately unsatisfactory experience, uh, argument. And that is the view that natural evil often turns out to have been caused by human sin. It looks like it's natural, it look, looks like it has no human cause at all, but the more you look at it, the more you find that in fact it does. Uh, we had a, a tragedy some years ago now in the UK 
where a ferry um, called the Helder Free, Free Enterprise sank on its way out of Zeebrugge Harbour on its way back from Belgium to the UK. And initially it looked like it was just an, a freak wave that had hit the ship and caused it to keel over and it was a case of natural evil and there was no human involvement in that at all. But the more we discovered about it and the more investigative journalists got to work on it, the more we discovered that it wasn't quite that simple that the company had been trying to speed up the return process, shorten the journey to such an extent uh, that it wasn't shutting the doors before it left the harbour in order to maximise profit. Uh, so in fact what it initially looked like a natural disaster turned out to be a case of moral evil. Um, so it's a useful argument it whittles away at the problem. Sometimes things do turn out to have been caused by human sin. But you can't trace all human disaster to human agency like that. So the last of the useful but unsatisfactory arguments is that natural disasters occur because of the disruption caused by what Christian theologians call the fall i.e. the sin of Adam and Eve. And that actually, I think, has a lot of mileage in it. When you look at Genesis 3, the story of the fall, uh, you get them rebelling against God, and then that distorts their relationship with, with God. They hide from God rather than talk to him and have a relationship with him. That distortion of their relationship with God distorts where their relationship with each other, they blame each other, their children kill each other. Uh, it distorts their relationship with themselves, they feel shame where they didn't, and it distorts their relationship with the natural world. Thistles and toil grow up where there had been harmony. <coughs> So it's a way of saying all the things that we see, all the divisions within our world, are the result of the fundamental division between us and God. And if you could put, sort that out, you could sort out all the others as well. Now I think that is a profound analysis of the human condition, the cosmic condition. I think it's a hopeful analysis because it means that if you can heal that fundamental relationship between us and God, you can put right all the others in principle and in time. And I think it's plausible. So interrelated, we know the more we find out about our world, the more interrelated the different dimensions of it prove to be. A butter butterfly beating its wings in Madagascar can cause a hurricane in Hawaii. We know that. But I think it's unsatisfactory, this view, because if there is any truth to modern science at all, then there's been pain and killing and suffering and death in the world long before human beings ever emerged. So it doesn't do to blame it all on us. Why were those things happening before we even appeared? If the world is out of sync because we are out of sync with God and one, one another, that might explain why does natural disasters occur now, but why before the fall? Why before human beings ever appeared? How can we reconcile what we know from science that as far back as we can see from the records and the fossils, we find evidence of one species preying upon another for its very existence and survival? How we can reconcile all that with the Genesis account, which sees all such things as the result of human disobedience and presents the time before the fall as a time of harmony, peace and bliss? Or does it? I used to think it did, and then I looked more carefully. And actually, that's not what it says. For one thing, there's the serpent. However you interpret the serpent, there is a bit of the natural world actively working against the purposes of God before human beings ever rebel. So even before human beings sin, there's already something working actively against 
the plan and purpose of God. And secondly, there's the command to fill the earth and subdue it, which suggests that there's something there that needs to be subdued even before human beings rebel. But that ex exacerbates the problem. If there's stuff that needs subduing, why is there stuff that needs subduing? What has gone wrong and who's to blame? So I probably ought to come clean and uh, give you my solution to the problem. Uh, this is speculative, I can't prove it. It's not taught in the Bible, though I think there is biblical evidence for it. It's not the teaching of the Episcopal Church or any major denomination, it's not there in the creeds. You're getting the picture, I'm a complete maverick. Um, <laughs> but not a complete maverick, other people have gone this, this route. All I claim is that it is a hypothesis that fits the facts, both theological and scientific. And this is it. So in Jewish and Christian tradition, uh, it's always been believed that human beings are not the only free rational beings in existence. That there is a whole spiritual dimension of which we are normally unaware, but which is nonetheless real for that. And I'm referring to the angelic realm, the demonic realm, and all that. In Jewish and Christian tradition, the angels were given the job of caring for creation. And in Jewish and Christ Christian tradition, there has been a rebellion within that spiritual dimension. Prior to the human fall, and that's important, prior to the human fall, there has been an angelic fall. The whole Lucifer being expelled from heaven motif. And all that I'm suggesting is that that could have distorted the whole way in which creation developed. So this is my scenario. I'm very fond of the word scenario. It's one of my favourite words. Uh, it reminds me of a kind of Shakespearean character. Ah, scenario! <laughs> in love with the fair agenda, or something like that. Um, this is my scenario. God begins the process of creating the universe. Everything is at harmony with everything else, because it's in harmony with God, its source. There is then a rebellion within the spiritual dimension of that creation. That introduces division, distortion, pain, suffering, death, predation, conflict. Human beings evolve in what is now a violent and competitive process. Human beings, once they have evolved, are called to undo the evil that the angelic fall had caused. They're called to fill the earth and subdue it. They're called to heal creation to put it right, to bring it back to that order and harmony which was always God's purpose for it. Instead of being the solution to the problem, however, they become part of the problem by joining in that rebellion. That's why Genesis 3 can say it's all our fault, even though these things occurred before us. Because had we remained faithful, we would have eradicated it. We would have healed it. We would have subdued it. So the continued occurrence of evil and suffering is due to our disobedience, even though its original occurrence was due to the angelic fall. And if you want to know what it would have looked like for human beings to heal creation, look at the person of Jesus. Here at last is a human being doing what human beings were always intended to do, healing the wounds and the hurts and the divisions and the distortions of our world, stilling the storms, healing the sick, raising the dead. Here at last, the destructive effect of the fallen angels is being put right and creation is beginning to be set free from its bondage to decay, to suffering and to death. Why did God let the angels rebel in the first place if he knew they were going to have that sort of effect? 
because he didn't make them robots any more than he makes us robots. He couldn't force their love any more than he can force ours. He's just not the tyrant sort of God who insists that he makes all the decisions, he exercises all the power, and no one has the freedom to gainsay him. He's the sort of God who gives his creatures real freedom, lets them make real choices, real decisions, even if, uh, <coughs> if their decision is to withhold their love. He will not force us. So we come back full circle to the free will defense. We come back to the position that all evil is the result of creatures abusing the free will that God has given them, but not just the human creatures. You have to take into account the other aspects and dimensions of God's multidimensional world, those of the angelic and demonic realms. That's my suggestion. Uh, take it or leave it. Chance to discuss it, complain about it. Rants and tirades welcome uh, in the question and answer session in a moment or two. All I claim is that it enables us to say what we need to say. It enables us to say what we need to say theologically, which is that God is not the author of evil or suffering. And that, after all, is part of the good news. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. It enables us to say what we need to say pastorally to those in pain, that what you are going through is not the will of God. Because we tend to think that God is behind our illness or our bereavement or whatever it may be. And at the very time that we most need to know that God is with us and for us and on our side, we actually think of, think of him as being against us and the cause of our problem and our pain. And my suggestion enables us to say no. God is not against you. Your suffering is part of the evil that free creatures have brought into the world, and God is against it, as you can see from the ministry of Jesus, but he is for you. And finally, it enables us to speak with hope. Because if suffering doesn't belong in God's world, if it's not built into God's world, if it's extraneous to it, then it can be rooted out. If suffering was not the first word about creation, it doesn't have to be the last. And if all evil is ultimately moral evil, and if sin has been dealt with on the cross and Satan defeated, then we can look forward to a day when we see creation healed of all that currently mars it. A day on which all created things will be at peace. The wolf lying down with the lamb, the lion eating straw like the ox, the eyes of the blind opening, the ears of the deaf unstopped, and the lame leaping, and the dumb singing, and the dead living, and the wilderness blossoming, and the whole creation flooded with the presence and the glory of God. That's all I know. Um, and I think we have a roving mic. I mean, there's this, there's this roving mic, but <laughs> there's another roving mic over there. Because um, it's just possible that, though all perfectly good common sense that I've been saying, there might possibly be the odd question or objection. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so an objection maybe to your argument would be that God is still not off the hook for evil because he is unjustified ethically in waiting so long to work towards the restoration of the world. And maybe everything you said is true, but he is unethical in his tardiness. That's a very important question, thank you. Um, and the annoying thing about the roving mic is uh, th there's no need for me to repeat the question, so I don't get time to think while I'm repeating <laughs> the question. Uh, so that's a bit of a pain. I think what I would say is that the disruption of the relationship between human beings and God uh, is hugely disruptive of our understanding of God. Uh, we are 
to use a technical term, epistemologically messed up. Um, and therefore, God actually has to rebuild the very fundamental categories of understanding of who he is. So when you read through the Old Testament, that is what God is doing. He's trying to hammer into our messed up skulls uh, that there's one of him, that he is good, uh, that, you know, basic morality. Uh, those concepts take a long time to embed themselves within the human psyche. And the Old Testament is a long, sorry saga of that, what C.S. Lewis calls the hammering process. If he had simply come in the person of Jesus without that preparation, nobody would have recognized him. Nobody would have understood who he was, and therefore they wouldn't have benefited from the revelation of God that, that came in the person of Jesus. Nor would they have understood the putting right that happened with the cross and the resurrection. There was a huge number of categories he had to build awareness of in us before coming amongst us to put things right would make any sense whatsoever. So that's, that's how I would begin to answer that kind of question, but it's really important. Thank you. Much of what you said is causal in nature. Um, things are because something's caused it. Um, the one place that I'm missing the causal is why or how those angel, angelic beings or at the beginning had their first fall when all they had was presence with God. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, so why would the angels themselves have rebelled in the first place? Is that... Yeah. Um, and, and that is a, a really significant question. At one level, um, I mustn't give too good an answer to that question. Not that I'm in any danger of doing so. But, <laughs> but I mustn't give too good an answer because that might suggest that evil is rational. And evil is not fully rational. Uh, it's an aberration. Um, and I think all I can say is... Uh, that the possibility of that um, division, that rebellion, is there in the fact that the angels were made separate from God, they were made other than God, um, and secondly, in the nature of God, that God is not somebody whose presence compels obedience. We tend to think of human bosses as those who get their way, and everybody just obeys them. Well, God isn't actually like that, as Jesus himself made clear in his teaching about leadership, uh, when he said that, um, you know, the leaders, the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over their subjects, it shall not be so amongst you. Uh, God is not an overpowering, overbearing presence that simply forces you to do things his way and see things his way. Uh, and so the possibility of rebellion is innate in their createdness and God's nature. Um, so that, that's, that's, I think, the best I can do. And probably uh, my excuse for not doing better is that I mustn't do for the reasons I said earlier. Uh, I didn't want you to leave here without knowing that John Stott uh, graced this church with a uh, lecture. And, uh, and I believe Sermon as well during uh, his stay here with our former rector, Ted Schroeder, who befriended him and made, was a great friend of his at Old Souls. And uh, his, his lecture to the vestry was on Hebrews 11, and I'll never forget it. Uh, one didn't forget John Stott's sermons and, and lectures. Um, he was a huge influence on me. Um, I remember I mentioned earlier the, the time of depression and doubt that I went through. Um, and I actually wrote to him at that point and asked some questions that were pressing on me very heavily. Um, I got a four page reply from him. This is one of the most busy church leaders you can imagine. Um, 
and inviting me to go and spend the morning with him to talk them through further. So the very fact that I'm here uh, with somebody with a, with a continuing faith, at a human level, is very largely down to the way that he responded to that letter, that cry for help. So I'm very glad to hear of the link here. Thank you for being here. My name is Chris Graham. The question I have is, is uh, ask you actually, it's probably two questions, but I'll put them together so I'm not uh, over um, staying my, my, my opportunity here. So this matters because our ability to be able to move forward and try to be the healers of the world depended upon where we start. You've said elsewhere that uh, Bishop Butler was the definitive person who was able to put down one of the distracting philosophies that kept us being able to stay on, on focus. We, are, we have a major one in front of us right now. I'm not going to name it. You can do that. How does this tie into re getting us back on track? And who are your top five of voices who might be the the next uh, Bishop Butler to, to, to keep us there. Sorry, uh, how does this tie into, I missed that bit. So where you're starting, um, our understanding of evil, of where the world is, is critical to how we're gonna help restore it. We've got other worldviews right now which are competing with the worldview, with the view of evil that you're talking about. How do we apply the starting place to the solution, and who is, do you see as being the voices right now who can actually carry that message? Okay, that's a really interesting uh, question, thank you. I mean, I think, I think the real, what I've been talking about here is really important in terms of getting the Christian message understood and, and valued and seen for the same thing that it is and sanity-inducing thing that it is, because it says that the suffering is not inbuilt. The, the, it, it separates out the goodness of creation. This is, the world is a good thing that has gone wrong. It is not a bad thing. And that pastorally means that we are not bad things. We are good things that have gone seriously wrong. And pastorally, that makes a really significant difference. How we see each other and how we treat each other, if we treat each other as fundamentally good things, which have gone wrong, uh, that is a far more appealing and attractive, and I would argue psychologically healthy attitude than the one that sees us as being intrinsically, intrinsically messed up. And Because the, then there's no hope. So this offers hope, it offers a view of creation as good, which I think meshes with people's deepest uh, instincts. It offers a view of themselves as good things, hugely valued and intended and created by God. Uh, that, we, we live in a world where mental health struggles are really significant and seem to be on the increase. Why? because we don't know ourselves to be infinitely loved and valued uh, by the maker of the heavens and the earth. And if we knew that, I think uh, our self-esteem would be less of a problem than it currently is. And the way we treat one another would be improved as well. If we saw each other as made in the image of God, as reflections of who God is, unique reflections of who God is that I need if I'm to understand God better I need your perspective your story your narrative I need to attend to you because otherwise I simply have my own very limited very small perception of who God is uh, I think that would be transformative of our well-being and our um, and our hope so I think that is, this is really significant to offer to the world around us. It makes God good, and it makes us good. Ontologically good, not morally, 
but ontologically in the world, in the realm of being, we are good things. Because uh, God doesn't make things that aren't good. So I, I, I think what I've been arguing is, is important. Um, I think there's a whole lot of other ways in which uh, the gospel brings sanity to people. I think not least in our really fragmented society. I said earlier that originally when God began to create, he made, everything was in harmony with everything else because it was in harmony with him. If, you, if everything were in harmony with its source and its maker, everything would be in harmony with everything else. That's the structure that monotheism gives. It gives an opportunity for everything to be in harmony with everything else. We've got to work at it. We've got to keep uh, m trying to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. But it's there. If you don't have one God, if you have a whole lot of different gods, you do not have, you have a fractured and fragmented society. And that's what we have at the moment. And that's why we have it. Because we're actually polytheistic. Um, so that's a few little uh, random thoughts on, on how this sort of stuff helps. Um, and why I think our world would like to know it. Who, who are the voices who are saying it? Um, I think what I want to suggest is that there aren't enough of them. Uh, and the reason why there aren't enough of them is that Christians, we Christians have been talking to ourselves for so long, we haven't actually addressed the culture. We haven't actually addressed the wider society. And we've got to start doing that. Because um, the reason why the culture finds us irrelevant is because we've not been talking to them for two generations. And we've got to start doing that. Um, chance for the whole propaganda insert. Um, that's why at Wycliffe we've just set ourselves the modest target of fostering a new renaissance of Christian scholarship and culture. I don't know what we'll do next week, but <laughs> that's, that's what we've set ourselves to do. Um, and uh, there's a conference taking place in June um, called, called Fostering a New Renaissance at Whitcliffe, to which you're very warmly welcome. There are some copies of these at the back. And a few of the voices who I think I would say are significant uh, in that process, um, N.T. Wright, who's our senior research fellow at Whitcliffe, Oz Guinness, Professor Alastair McGrath, uh, going to be talking about C.S. Lewis as a his impact as a scholar and as a creative writer, and Sarah Clarkson, uh, who's a very inspiring creative writer herself. Um, so I think there aren't enough of those voices, uh, and we need to train ourselves, equip ourselves to speak humbly, intelligently, creatively, and appositely to the wider culture, because we've not been doing it. Uh, uh, sorry, if I could, um, first off, thank you. Um, I wanted to push back a little on, on your framing, if that's okay. Um, on, the, on, the, on the framework yep. of, your, of the conceit of yep. the, um, I the overarching question is, you know, how do you subdue a, a tornado? How do you subdue an earthquake? Like if, you know, how do you subdue a, a mother bear? you know, fighting for their young. And it seems like one of the things we struggle with here on this side of the pond is we've ignored the, the wisdom of indigenous tribes and how they teach us that this world is filled with spirit and that the nature, natural world does have spirit. We see this when Christ passes over, the earth shook, the earth definitely, Mother Earth definitely spoke their opinion of the situation of Christ's crucifixion. And what, because we've ignored the spirit world as a living being, as something to, as the earth, the natural world, as having spirit, it's caused us to uh, abuse it in a way that's now one of the most, causing one of the most existential crises of our times. And so what I don't see or hear in your, in this structure, 
is that I don't see the natural world as a participant. The, you know, God saw that it was good, creation was good, and he also saw that people were good in this free will with freedom included. And so why can't the natural world also be endowed with that same freedom and, and with, that, that same, with that same autonomy? We were to subdue the world but not dominate it. And so I, I don't see, I mean, I, I like the angelic concept. I just don't see why it's necessary to answer the question of why there are earthquakes or that nature. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I, I entirely agree with you about uh, the ecological crisis. I think that is a symptom, as I was suggesting, of uh, the world being cut off from its maker. There are sociological divisions that come in the wake of that. There are psychological divisions that come in the wake of that. But there are also ecological uh, divisions that come in the wake of that. And as Christians, we are committed to attacking those problems um, at every point. So we, we are called sociologically to attack the divisions between people and people by being peacemakers. We are called to help people uh, from the psychological divisions that each of us have within us by um, all the things I was talking earlier about uh, that, that make up for, for good mental health. Uh, and I'm glad to see that some of the Christian aid organizations are actually sponsoring uh, psychiatr psychiatrists and psychologists as well as doctors and nurses and surgeons. Uh, that's part of what we are called to be and to do. But we are also meant to be attacking the divisions at an ecological level. Uh, so Christian organizations like Arosha that um, are seeking to protect the earth and to uh, protect species that are threatened, that seems to be part of what it is to believe and to serve the creator. So I entirely agree with you about that. Um, I can't now remember the other bits of the question. So I, um, there was something else I was wanting to say. Oh, yes, about how we, how we do the subduing bit of it. Well, partly that all those ways. But remember how Jesus did it. Jesus was the one person who did still storms, who did have an impact upon the physical world. How did he do it? He did it by prayer, fundamentally. What was different about him from everybody else was the extraordinary intimacy, discipline, and, it, uh, and closeness of his prayer life. Um, and I think if we started there, we would find, as we have done with the saints of history, you know, people like St. Francis, tend to, their holiness tends to give them a more harmonious relationship with the natural world and with the animal world. Um, I think if our prayer life was more uh, disciplined and intimate, we would simply find that happening around us uh, to, to a greater extent than is currently the case. So that's the sort of area that I'd want to explore with you, but really important questions, thank you. Great, thank you for being here. Um, here, I'm over, I'm over here. Here I am. Here I am. I'll stand up. Here, here I am. Good. You, you've, talk, you've talked about free will, but also in the, in the garden there was the serpent who was an active participant. We know that, uh, that Jesus was tempted by the devil. So is there, aside from our free will and whether we decide to do evil or, or do good, is there still, or is there now, an active force of evil that, that, that we need to contend with? And, it, and if there is, how can we put on the full armor of God to protect us from that active force rather than just our free will to choose? And if you want me to hum a few bars so you have time to think for an answer, I'll, I'll be... <laughs> you're, you're very kind, but we'll take that as read. So is there an active force of evil? Yes, I believe there is. 
Um, in a sense, the logical consequence of my position is, is precisely that, that there is such a force, uh, otherwise my argument doesn't work. Um, but you mentioned the, Jesus being tempted by the devil, so let's look briefly at that passage, because it's really interesting. Um, Satan says to Jesus, uh, show, takes him up to a high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the earth and their splendor, and says, all these would I give you if you bow down and worship me. And the interesting thing to me is that Jesus doesn't say, no, they haven't been given to you, you lying hound. <laughs> he accepts that they have. Now, why? Who's given them to Satan? God? Why would God give the kingdoms of the earth and their splendor into the hands of a malevolent power who he knows is going to abuse them? No, it's not God who's done it. We've done it. We have given away our authority and, and in the process of, of making wrong moral decisions, cutting ourselves off from our maker, we have given an operational scope and power to an alien and malign force that does not legitimately own any such scope. We've given away our freedom and our authority and it's then being used against us. How do we lessen that? By not giving it away. By making predominantly right moral decisions. By getting back in touch with and in contact with and in prayerful, dis in dis in prayerful relationship with the God who made us. That will starve the enemy of oxygen uh, and stop and, and restrict and limit his operational scope. So, I, 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 yes, there is such a force, but it's not one that we are simply subject to and could do nothing about. How we behave and live impacts upon the operational scope that that evil force has. One, uh, one last question. Um, we have two weeks left of Lent. Yes. So in light of this conversation, what should we be uh, doing to um, build our faith, to get ready for Holy Week and, and the crucifixion and resurrection? Well, it's, 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 it's a, a kind of boringly obvious uh, answer, but, but prayer would be good. <laughs> um, if we are made for relationship with this God and have got cut off and this cascade of horror has come from us being cut off from him, then getting back in touch with him would be awfully nice. Um, and it would be awfully good for us and it would be awfully good for those who have to live with us and it would be good for our churches and it would be good for our nations and it would be good for our ecosystems and our planet. Um, prayer is, is everything else flows from that and just getting into better disciplines of prayer would, everything else would fall into place from there. Great. Michael Lloyd. <laughs> Thank you. In light of that uh, last admonition, let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we pray that um, in these last few moments of Lent that we would reconnect with you, that we'd fall deeply in love with you once again, that we would know your love and your goodness, your grace, your forgiveness, redemption, restoration, healing. And we would know it so fully that we would share it. We would live it. We would be it. And that others would come to know it as well through the life that we lead. Because you're working in us and we believe that you are and we expect you to show up. So, Lord God, we're thankful for the words that we heard this night. We're thankful for 
Michael's ministry. We pray for safe travels as he ventures home, and we pray that all of us would be filled with your grace and love. Guide us, lead us, and direct us. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We'll see you next week, if not before. Thank you. Thank you.